What's going on? It's Kevin Kenny, and we are coming to you live from the Build Studios in what has to be the coldest New York City ever. I mean, this is freezing, and we are going to warm things up certainly in just a few moments. We've got a live performance coming your way and an in-depth discussion with our guest today. Please, let's give a warm Build welcome to Michael Franti and Victoria Canal. How you feeling, y'all? What's up? Woo! It's great to be here. I like really. I mean, I, I make a joke, but we're gonna warm things up here. You we're guys are bringing here, positivity. Sure. You're bringing music. We did. We brought the snow too, actually, <laughs> from San Francisco by way of Sundance. We were out at the Sundance Film Festival a few days ago. I have a film that was out there, and so yeah, we just dragged the snow with us on the back of the airplane. If you see chemtrails going over Kansas, it was us. Yeah, it's a conspiracy. How, Victoria, how did you two meet? Oh my gosh. Well, I was um, wasting my time on a Tuesday at NYU last year, and I was scrolling through Instagram instead of doing my homework, and I got this message from Michael Franti, and he was like, hey dude, I love your music, I love how you play keys, and I think you're really inspiring, uh, I want to invite you to open for us at Red Rocks um, in front of 10,000 people in a couple months, and I was like... Well, well, basically that was my last day of school. So, <laughs> so we've basically been on tour the whole yeah. year. I had just was flipping through my explore feature on Instagram, and I follow a lot of musicians. So a lot of other musicians pop up, and I saw Victoria, and she was playing guitar, and I saw this woman who was born without part of her arm, and I was like, wow, who is this woman? So I turned the sound on, and I saw her playing piano, and then I heard her voice, and but mainly I heard her message of just. Um, inspiration and tenacity and being your authentic self. And I said, you, you, you sent her a message, you're perfect for what I'm doing with this album and I'd love to collaborate. So I invited her down to Nashville and I told her about my life, about how um, I was born to a woman who's Irish, German and Belgian and my birth father is African-American and not away Indian, but I was adopted by the Franti family who are second generation immigrants from Finland who came to America seeking a better life just like so many families have done for generations and generations. And uh, they adopted myself and another African-American son. So I grew up in this super mixed melting pot of a family, kind of like America, you know. And, um, and uh, when I was a kid, I'd go to schools where I was one of the only brown kids in school, and I would get bullied a lot. And so um, I told this story to Victoria when I first met her, and I said, what was it like for you growing up? Well, I was super stoked when he said that he felt different at school because being born without part of my right arm, obviously I felt really different too and I was um, bullied as a kid. Uh, but really what I, I learned through that experience, my, my brother uh, has bipolar disorder and he was actually more severely bullied than I was and um, his differences nobody else could see but they were very much there. So we were talking about the importance of uh, being empathetic towards others but also just accepting and embracing yourself exactly the way that you are. Yeah, so we started writing this song about it, which is The Flower. And um, this the song is, is about being your authentic self and standing up for who you are. But it's also about violence that comes from that, and in particular, gun violence. And so um, as we wrote the song and started to make the video for it, I traveled around the country and filmed families who'd been affected by gun violence. Uh, we went to Parkland High School three times. We went to the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. We spoke to families in Vegas who were there during the, the Vegas shooting at the concert Route 91. And uh, families who were involved in street violence, people who had taken their own lives through um, uh, suicide with guns, um, uh, people that spent 25 years in prison for murder who are now out, who are advocating for in their communities to bring an end to gun violence. And we found that um, gun violence is part of almost every community in America has it has touched. And um, we ho hope that the song becomes um, really a, an anthem for people who want to be part of the healing. And we believe that we need every single person in this country, no matter what your walk of life, your political experience, or whether you're a gun owner or not, to be part of the healing that is needed today to bring an end to gun violence in our country. Absolutely. And I think you certainly you address all that. Please, yeah. <laughs> you address that beautifully on the new album, Stay Human uh, 2. Is it 2 or part 2? Well, it's, it's volume 2. Okay. I made an album in 2001 called Stay Human, but this really doesn't have 
any correlation to that, the themes on that record, except that today I really believe that it's more important that we see each other as human beings. There's so much division when you go online. It's like, oh, I'm a Republican or I'm Democrat, so I can't like you because you vote a different way or something like that, or people are different, divided by, by skin color, by, um, by religion, by sexuality, like by so many different things. And, and I, look to, I like to look at things as we're all variations. It's not like diversity is still like dividing things up. We're all variations of humans. And uh, we have more in common than what we know. And our, we shouldn't just be defined by our political values. We should be defined by who we are as human beings. And some people like to paint, another person likes to paint, let's build on that theme. Someone likes to cook, other people likes to cook, similar taste in music, whatever, let's build on those themes. And, and it's important that everybody still be able to, like a fruit salad, you don't wanna have to change your fruit. You can still be a strawberry and still be part of the salad and be yeah. part of it. But um, uh, we're all part of that, that's, that same uh, human family. I understand that was actually a pretty big priority while, while writing this record, is you wanted to address what's going on in our world and what's going on in our country specifically, but you wanted to do it through that positive lens. You talk a lot about how positivity is something you got to pr uh, practice, right? It's, something you gotta, it's almost like a muscle you got to work out. Yeah. At what point in your life, were you always a positive person, or do, is that something you realized, okay, I have to really get good at this? You know, I believe in the power of optimism, and I believe that the great battle that's taking place in the world today isn't between left or right or religion or races, the great battle is, that's taking place within all of us is between cynicism and optimism. And I wake up every day and I read the news and I feel like this world is a total shit show. <laughs> and I, I get really bummed out and I get frustrated. And I'm somebody who throughout my adult life have battled depression and anxiety. But one thing I've learned is if I can change my thoughts, I can change my feelings. And one of the ways that I do that is, is, is by speaking to other people, sharing with them the things that I'm going through and the challenges that I'm facing. And then I see what they're, what they're going through. And the film that I've made, Stay Human, is all about that. It's how I get up and travel around the world and I meet people who have extraordinary rela relationships, like Hope and Steve December, who live in Atlanta. And Steve has very advanced stages of ALS. And um, uh, one day his wife Hope was tweeting me saying, Steve, would love to come to your concert. It might be the very last show he ever gets to go to. So we invite them to the show. And at this point, um, you know, Steve, uh, ALS robs you of your ability to move. So it's a neuromuscular disease. One day your hand doesn't work, your arm, your legs. And by the time I met Steve, he couldn't move at all except for his eyes and he could only speak in whispers. But I invited them out onto the stage. And in the middle of this song, he looks up at his wife and he says, Hope, I want to get up and dance. And so in front of 20,000 people at this festival, she, with all her strength, lifts him up out of this chair. And they have this beautiful slow dance in front of it. All these people are cheering and crying. And, and I, I'm, I'm cheering and crying. And look over at my wife. She is too. And, and, uh, and asked Steve afterwards, I said, what did that mean to you? He said, you know, yesterday I was wheeling around this festival in my chair. And people didn't know how to really relate to me. So they would just walk past me and not look at me. But after that moment, I became Steve. And suddenly people were coming up saying, hey, Steve, come dance with us, come party with us, come rock out with us, Steve. And he said it was a game changer for, for him and his life. And so my wife and I said, let's do this for as many families as we possibly can. And we started a nonprofit called Do It For The Love that brings people who are living with the end stages of life-threatening illness and kill kids and adults with special needs and wounded veterans to see any live concert anywhere in the world. So people just write to us and say, my sister has stage four breast cancer. She's always wanted to see Beyonce, and we get them out to the concert. So the film is all about stories like that. Hope and Steve are featured in the film, and it's you know, people in South Africa and Indonesia and the Philippines, all over America, who are people who inspire me. So it's a really uplifting film about holding on to our, our humanity in challenging times. It's all just such a testament, though, to how powerful and how healing music can be. I want to get back briefly to you know, the hardships you guys both shared growing up as just feeling a little bit different, feeling a little bit out of place. Victoria, what, was, what role did music play in your young life in terms of giving you, uh, you know, a companion or, or to guide you through that hardship? Um, music was a way for me to connect with people uh, without having to you know, use words. I could I could get up on stage and, and not say anything and just play things that I had come up with in my room and, and feel more connected and more, um, 
you know, understood than ever. And, and I think, you know, hearing other people come up to me and say, you know, that melody really meant something to me or uh, seeing you play the way you do despite your adversity, it really helped me to believe in myself. Uh, it's, it's cool that music is so much more than what it just sounds like. Like it can symbolize um, someone's, you know, monumental progress in their life and, and new growth and uh, moments. It, it's just so much more than what it seems to be. Totally. I uh, along the same lines, Michael. I heard uh, you share a story recently about um, you know you grew up in a household where your dad battled alcoholism, and you were uh, recounting a story where your dad was fighting with your mom, and you were in your room, you had the covers pulled up, and your headphones were blasting, just trying to escape from it all. What would you listen to at those times? What music would you kind of like go to to escape? Well, I, I I lived in a university town, Davis, California, and so I would always I was listening to the university radio station, and like one hour it was hip hop, then it was punk rock, then it was electronic music, then it was Chinese news, and then it was like <laughs> jazz, and then it was the reggae hour, and so um, I would listen to everything, and music was my it was my travel. It was like my way to like experience the world and hear sounds from all around the world and hear um, voices of, of um, rebellion, you know, and people who were, st were stepping out and saying, I feel like things could be different than the way they are right now. And so, you know, my favorite groups growing up were storytellers who could make you dance. So I loved Bob Marley for that reason. I love Johnny Cash for that reason. I love The Clash for that reason. I love yeah. Run DMC for that reason. I love Public Enemy for the same reason. And so I just grew up in a household where there was all kinds of music all the time, and my mom played organ in the church, and so that meant I had to be in the choir. So I was the tallest kid in the choir, and I <laughs> stood in the back, which meant that most of the time I could just lip sync the words <laughs> when I didn't want to sing, which is actually really great training for being a pop star if you want to. <laughs> um, but um, music was always a part of my life, and it became my solace. You know, like when I was uh, I had a crush on this girl named Sally Pinkner in fourth grade when I had a crush on her <laughs> I uh, couldn't tell my parents about it you know because I just felt so self-conscious but I could hear songs that let me know that it was okay to feel that way you were uh, speaking about the making of the new record recently mm -hmm. and uh, you said that you feel each album in your career sort of marks a sign of the times or, or you know it's a, it's a stamp for what's going on in the world and that struck me because I think for a lot of artists they may say well each album is a mark of what's going on in, in their world as opposed to our world. Do you approach music from an empathetic standpoint uh, would you say because it, it seemed a little bit different than what mm -hmm. a typical artist might say. Well I, tr I try to do a combination of both you know because I believe that music is the sound of feelings. So music is the sound of my feelings, and it's the sound of the feelings that are happening in the world at the time. And so I try to write songs that um, are both. And, th and that's, the, you hit the nail on the head with the word empathy. That's, that's really what that is, you know. And, and um, a few years ago, I got a chance to play for the Dalai Lama on his 80th birthday. And um, afterwards, I, we were talking about empathy, and, 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 and he said, you know, Michael, if, um, we, if we had, you know, more people in the world that were empathetic, that would be great. But it would just mean that we had a world of really nice people who didn't do anything. <laughs> and he said, what we need are people who are compassionate. We need people who have empathy, who are driven to do compassionate deeds to help other people out. And, and I feel like that message is really missing in all the dialogue that we see taking place, in, in, you know, nationally and politically. But it's not missing from what's happening on the street. And I see people who are living that life of compassion, who are reaching out to each other. And I, as I mentioned, as I travel around the country talking to families who have been affected by gun violence, they are really the ones who are on the front line of that, who are reaching out and trying to make sure that it doesn't happen to other people that um, living in their communities. And those people you talk about throughout the country, these everyday people, these are the stars of the documentary, I understand. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're the stars of the documentary, and they're people who all lead with love. And that, I guess that was the main thing that, that I found. And, and it, as I've made the documentary for over the last five years, I learned one really important thing, which is that there's no one that you wouldn't love if you knew their story. And if you took the time to sit down with anybody um, you, you, and hear where they're from and hear what their experiences are, it's impossible not to love them and feel that connection with them. And so... Uh, I, as a filmmaker, that was really my my job was just to try to tell their stories in the, in the best way possible, so that people could could feel that. And that's so cool. You guys took it to Sundance. How was Sundance, Victoria? It was so cool. I went skiing. 
Okay. Um, yeah, it was, it was really fun. Uh, he screamed his, his film, and I watch it every single time. I think we've done, like, how many, like, 30, 40, whatever. And I, I watch it every single time I cry, and I just feel so inspired. It's amazing the, the things you can learn when you stop thinking about your own life and your own life situations for a second and realize that, uh, you know, there's just so much more out there, oh, and yeah. it's always worth counting your blessings. That's what that film taught me is just count your blessings. And I got to ask you, we kind of glossed over this. You, I'm guessing you went to Red Rocks. You took up uh, Michael's invitation. Yeah, I did the gig. Well, yeah, what was that like? That's like the <laughs> pinnacle for every artist. It's like a joke on Bill. Like, everybody comes here, and they're like, yeah, Red Rocks, Red Rocks, Red Rocks. Yeah. So what was that like? That was so crazy. I mean, it was the first gig that we did that I opened for them. And, um, you know, 10,000 people, it's a lot of people. Oh, yeah. uh, I didn't realize how many until I got there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, But it was cool. I, I, looking back on it, on all the footage that's online, I'm super embarrassed because I looked and felt so shy. And I feel like I've improved a lot. But we're going back this year. I'm doing yeah, the June, same June opening. 7th. Yeah, yeah, June 7th. Oh, that's back. amazing. So I feel like with a year of, of like shows under my belt, it would have improved a little bit. You're going to be a rock star on June Fucking 7th. Fucking rock star. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. That's awesome. All right, guys. Well, we have so many amazing fans here. We're going to uh, turn it over for a studio audience question before you guys perform. And that question is going to come from right up front. Hey, Michael. I am um, good. I was going to ask you about your musical influences, but you kind of covered that a little bit. Because I hear, like, Joe Jackson, the specials. I hear Van Morrison. I hear, you know, Cat Stevens. I hear a lot of different people. So instead of that, since you touched on it, how's being a new dad? Um, well, first of all, I love all those artists that you mentioned, and uh, being new dad is uh, great because when my fr I have two sons who are older, and when they were born, I was like so young, and I really felt just like man, I don't have anything going in my life, and I was just hustling all the time to try to. I worked two jobs. I was a bike messenger in the daytime, and I worked as a doorman at, at a nightclub checking IDs to make sure everyone was over 21, and I was like 19 at the time, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so. Um, at that time, you know, my focus was so scattered. And now, the second time around, my son's he's four months old now, and I'm so locked into his every emotion, his every movement. Did he do this today? He learned how to roll onto his side, you know. And I've learned a lot about the importance of facial communication, you know, like just I walk into the room and he's smiling. And my face can't help, but like the corners of my lips raise up. It's like instinctive. And then if he's got a little sadness, I'm like, oh, my face curls down like his. And, and he makes this great face that we call the poopy face, which is like this. He goes, <laughs> and I know he's going to poop. And whenever he does that, we're so connected, I just run to the bathroom. I'm like, oh, geez, oh, geez. <laughs> So being 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 a dad is awesome, and and it also makes you think like, uh, what do we want to create for our next generation? You know, and I and I think like, you know, if over the last you know decades of my life that I had done everything I could, could the world have been like a little bit better than it is right now? And that challenges me to to keep going and to try to you know leave something that uh, has you know, more meaning and more opportunities for more people. Um, and that everybody can have those same opportunities. So, yeah. The first time I saw you was at a festival in Kauai. And uh, I have a friend that just texted me. Ask him when he's coming back. Ask him when he's coming back. <laughs> well, we're going to be back in, in Hawaii in uh, early May. But we're not going to be at Kauai this time. We're just going to be in Oahu and Maui. So they'll have to get in a kayak and hop over. Or, yeah. <laughs> Is there, is there like a formal tour or are you kind of doing yeah, shows? Yeah, so we're going to be touring. We're going to be announcing it, the, the tour early in February of all the tour dates, but we've got some great things lined up for the summer and we're super excited about it. Um, you know, Carl Young, who you'll meet in a moment, who plays bass with, in my band, we've been playing together for 25 years and this summer we both at the end of the summer looked at each other and said this is the most enjoyment that we've ever had from playing music. And so after 25 years of doing it, um, we love it more than we ever had before. And the other day I was looking on one of the music charts, you know, it's like the most added songs at radio. So when you put out a song, it's like you want to get the stations to add it to their playlist, you know. And so I looked at the chart and it was like Sam Smith, Ariana Grande, Pink, Michael Franti, and then something else, and Victoria Canal, and like Mumford and Sons. And I was looking at the chart and I go, you know, I think I'm the only artist on the chart whose first record was a record. <laughs> 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 
That's amazing. Well, yeah. uh, speaking of tour, we're going to get a little bit of a taste of what you can expect later in 2019 from these guys, Michael, Victoria, and, of course, Carl will be joining you on stage. So if you're watching along at buildseries.com, don't go anywhere. Moments away from a live performance here on the Build stage. But please, one more time for Michael and Victoria, guys. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.